Good morning to everybody. It's time for us to go ahead and start, if you will, come on in. For those of you that are normally in Mr. Gary's class, there are notes, uh, class notes for this class sitting in the back. If you, want, if you haven't got some, you can get a set of the notes that we'll be going over this morning. If you will, uh, go ahead and open in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. We'll be covering Acts chapter 5 this morning. Acts chapter 5, verse 1, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now all of us in here know that uh, when Luke wrote this down originally, he did not break it down into chapters and verses. Uh, And so the ones that decided to break this up in my opinion, did not do a very good job. Uh, The beginning of this chapter connects us back to what we talked about last week in chapter 4, but a man named Ananias and Sapphira. Um, You remember at the end of the chapter, uh, it was highlighted the unity that was was enjoyed within the church. Uh, And we, for the second time, uh, at least, were told how the members of the congregation were willing to sell the properties that they had and give to the, the other members who had need. Uh, and so this is the, that is the second time at least that we've seen that the church, the members of, of the church there in Jerusalem were willing to sell the properties that they had and give to those who had need. Now specifically, Luke highlighted one man. His name was Joseph. Now the apostles changed his name to Barnabas, son of encouragement. Now, why Barnabas was highlighted, I don't know. My guess is uh, that it's probably because of the role that he's going to play throughout the rest of the book of Acts, possibly. Um, But no doubt his gift was something that had an effect on on the congregation, so much so that the apostles changed his name to Son of Encouragement, to Barnabas. Uh, And now we are going to be given an example of something that was not good. now the, there's going to be a comparison between what the church had, the unity the, that they were enjoying, the love that they had for all the members, but now we have Ananias and Sapphira. I find it interesting that the name Ananias means Yahweh has been gracious. Here we are, we're talking about a man who has enjoyed the graciousness of God, who has been blessed by God. And yet here we're going to see some selfishness stemmed out from this couple. Uh, And so uh, we are told that they sold a piece of property uh, and both of them understood what they were doing. With his wife's knowledge, they held back some of the proceeds. Now we'll see later on, uh, I think it becomes clearer that it wasn't necessarily wrong for them to hold on to some of it. What was the problem? They made it seem like this was the total price. What I'm giving you is the total price of the land. And I think we'll see that uh, fleshed out for us in some of these other verses that we're going to read in just a minute. Now, before I move on into verse 3, I want you to underline or highlight in your mind the words kept back in verse 2. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Just, just hang on to that for just a moment. That is going to play an important role in just a moment. Uh, verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Uh, and so Peter, of course, understands that Satan ultimately is at work here, uh, and Satan had filled Ananias' heart. Now, How did Jesus describe Satan, the adversary? The father of what? Father of lies, right? And so if Satan has filled Ananias' heart, ultimately what's going to come out of Ananias? Lies. Same thing that could be said for us. Um, If we allow Satan to infiltrate our heart, uh, what are we going to be? We're going to be those that are liars. Uh, And so we see that with Ananias. Verse 4 While it remained unsold, this is Peter talking to Ananias, 
while it, the land, remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? So, verse 4 kind of starts help, helping us understand what the problem is with Ananias and Sapphira. While the property was in their possession, no one was going to command them to sell this property. That's what Peter's saying. This was not a commandment. You did not have to do this. And even after you sold it, was it still not at your disposal? The proceeds that you got from this land sale, it was still yours to choose how you wanted to spend it. No one was going to have a problem with you keeping some of the proceeds. So again, what's the problem? Ananias and Sapphira lied. They were making it seem like everything that, that what they had given was the, the total price for the land that they had sold. Uh, going on at the end of verse 4, you have, lied not, uh, you have not lied to men but to God. We need to appreciate there in verse 3 um, that Peter attributed Ananias' lie, uh, lying to the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 4, who does he attribute that lie to going against? To God. Therefore, God, hold the Holy Spirit is what? Is God. So we see some evidence of that here. Uh, verse Verse 5, uh, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. He died. Uh, and great fear came upon all those who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now in this time, in this particular part of the world, that would have been very uncommon for someone to die and immediately be buried. Uh, most of the time, they would have been buried that day or the next day due to the uh, the atmosphere that they were in. They wanted to bury them quickly for obvious reasons. Um, but for this to be so unceremonious was very, very uh, unusual. Uh, usually when somebody died, there was a big to-do, a big funeral. They even hired professional mourners a lot of times to go ahead of the procession and be crying and wailing and all these different things. And so this just goes to highlight the seriousness uh, of, of what Ananias and Sapphira did. Now, appreciate the fact that the result of this was great fear coming upon all those who heard. Um, I, I do think that probably some of the fear would have been actual fear, um, at least if I put myself in that situation. I think there probably would have been some fear, but I also think what's being discussed here is a profound amount of respect. Uh, that those who heard about this had for the, not only the apostles, but God himself. Um, and so we see uh, Ananias falling down and breathing his last um, for the result of his lying to God. Verse 7, After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Now how in the world did she not know what had happened? Yeah, it, it highlights the fact of how quickly uh, the young man took the body of Ananias and, and buried him. Uh, it happened quite quickly. Um, the only thing that I can come up with is I tend to, I, I wonder at least if Peter told the congregation, hey, don't say anything about this. We're not trying to trap Sapphira, but we don't, we don't, need, to, we don't need to talk about this right now. Okay? We need to give her a chance, and I think we'll see this in just a moment. We need to give her a chance to confess and make the sin right. Make it right. Uh, I think we'll see that in just a moment. Um, but she came in and she had not known what had happened. Verse 8, And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. I think this really pulls together what helps us understand what had been going on with Ananias and Sapphira. I can almost see Peter when she comes in pointing to the money that was sitting at his feet saying, tell me, is this the price that y'all sold the land for? Um, and so really, uh, his inquiry is, is giving her an opportunity to confess. Uh, I don't think he's trying to trap her. That would not be loving. Uh, that would not be kind. I think what Peter is doing is he is trying to give her an opportunity to confess what her and her husband had uh, contrived together. Um, and that is actually a characteristic of God. When you go back specifically in the Old Testament, uh, a lot of times you'll see God ask a question of somebody. Does He ask a question of somebody for His own personal knowledge? 
Of course not. Uh, you think back to uh, Cain and Abel when Cain killed his brother. What did he ask Cain? Where is your brother? Right? What, what, where, where is he? What have you done with him? Did God need to ask? No. What was he doing? He was giving Cain an opportunity to confess. And I think we see Peter uh, doing something along the, the same lines here. So he asks Sapphira, is this the price that y'all sold the land for? And what does she do? Notice in verse 9, or at the end of verse 8, and she said yes for so much. So she stubbornly uh, continued with the lie. She was given an opportunity to confess, um, but she did not take that opportunity. And so she uh, did the same thing that her husband did and lied about the price uh, that was given to the church. Verse 9, But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Now, what does it mean to test the Spirit of the Lord? This probably will, uh, in your mind, <clears throat> take you back to the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. Uh, they were described as testing God over and over. They were stubborn. They didn't listen to God. They were disobedient. And they tested Him over and over and over. In some respects, this is similar to all of us who have children. We have experienced this, haven't we? What does every child have a tendency to do with mom and dad? They're going to test the boundaries, aren't they? They're going to see how far they can get. Okay? And every child is going to do that. It's almost human nature. And so in some respects, that is what Ananias and Sapphira had done. They had, they had tested God to see how far, how far can we go with God. Well, God showed them, didn't He? You're not going to cross this line. Uh, and so in some respects, that's how they were testing God. But I think there may be another way that they were testing God. They were testing His knowledge. I don't think they knew that they were doing that but they were testing whether God is truly all-knowing. I think this is very important. They had contrived this plan together in private. But was it out of God's eye? No, it was not. I think that's important for you, for you and I. We know this, but do we live like this? We know that nothing we do is going to escape the knowledge of God. I know that in my mind. Do I live like that, though? What about you? Ananias and Sapphira, they were testing God. Um, so Peter goes on, uh, Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. So uh, we see the great fear upon specifically the church this time and again on all those who heard. Now before we move on into verse 12, I want to pause just for a moment and appreciate some important lessons I think that we can learn from this account from Ananias and Sapphira. First of all, this is the first recorded underline that word, recorded sin within the church. I think that's significant. This is a sin that is attached to greed, to uh, selfishness, and to hypocrisy. Now, why would that be important for me and you? I think especially for us in the country that we live in and the way the world is, it can be easy for us to fall into uh, a situation of being greedy at times. I have been that way at times. And so we see the result of Ananias and Sapphira maybe loving the money just a little too much. Uh, and we see what that led to. And so the first recorded sin uh, within the church can be rooted or connected to greed and jealousy. And I think that should give us pause and, and help us to give us, uh, get us to look at our life and make sure that we are not going down that same road as well. Now, I have a question for you. Was this punishment handed down by God, was it too harsh? 
Critics of Scripture will point to this account and tell you that God is vindictive, that He is jealous and unloving. Are they correct? No, they're not. And there's something for us to be able to understand this. We need to appreciate something uh, about God. Uh, from time to time, in His dealings with man, uh, He has demonstrated how serious sin is in his viewpoint. Uh, I think back to uh, Leviticus chapter 10. Oftentimes when God did this, it was when his people were beginning a new relationship or entering into a new part of their relationship with him. For example, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 10, that's within the context of the priesthood being established within the nation of Israel. What happened in Leviticus chapter 10? Nadab and Abihu offered unauthorized fire, and what happened? They were consumed by it. What was God doing? He was demonstrating how serious He was about people violating His commands. Not only that, you think about uh, Uzzah. Uzzah was uh, trying to grab onto the ark that was about to fall, right? Israel was in the context there in 2 Samuel chapter 6, they were fixing to renew their covenant with God under the leadership of David. And Uzzah reached out and tried to get the ark and keep it from falling. And what happened? He died. He violated God's command. But probably the, the, most, or, or the best example of, com of comparison here is in Joshua chapter 7. The children of Israel are fixing to enter into the land of Canaan. Uh, they have begun this conquest... And the first city that they are going to conquer is what? Jericho. The walls came tumbling down. Jericho. Now what had God said? God said, everything that you get in Jericho is mine. The first fruits belong to me. They're mine. Now, did everyone obey that? No. In Joshua chapter 7... You have Achan. And the reason I wanted us to remember in verse 2 when it said, uh, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back, the very same description is given to Achan in Joshua chapter 7 when those translators translated the Hebrew language into the Greek translation. And so the same exact Greek word is used in Joshua chapter 7 uh, when it describes Achan uh, taking some of what was supposed to be God's when they conquered Jericho. Uh, and of course, we know what happened to Achan, right? Uh, he was basically put on trial. He was given an opportunity to confess. Um, and he ended up being punished by being stoned with him and his family. Uh, and so God, again, demonstrates how serious he is about violating his commands. I think we are at times in danger of being lackadaisy about sin. I know I can be. I think about some of the things that I allow to be put into my mind, and put into my heart, by the songs that I may hear, or the things that are on TV. That is not what God wants me to be putting into my heart. Is that serious? In God's eye it is. And so here we see a very, very, very good example of what God thinks about sin and how serious he is about it not being a part of his people. And so we need to strive to stay away from it as much as we possibly can. The last thing I want us to uh, understand before we move on is in verse 11, when Luke records, and great fear came upon the whole church. This is the first time of 23 times in the book of Acts that Luke uses the word church. Now I know some of you are thinking, now wait just a minute. My Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. In the original manuscripts, the church is not there at the end of Acts chapter 2. It's there in thought, it's there in idea, but it's not recorded by Luke. This is the first time that he uses the word church. We all know what that is. It's the saved ones. It's the called out ones, right? It's God's special people. However, I think Luke using it here for the first time provides us with an important lesson. 
You and I cannot be God's special people if we allow sin to be a part of the church. In order for us to be God's chosen people, to be His special people, we have to purge sin from among us. And I think that is an important lesson for us today. So, Ananias and Sapphira certainly teaches us, uh, most importantly, I think, what God thinks uh, and his view of sin. All right, verse 12. <clears throat> now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. What was the result, what was part of the result at least, of the discipline that was handed down within the church? Unity. And they were all together. I think sometimes I wonder if we are scared of discipline within the church. But we see here, at least part of the result of that is unity. Verse 13, None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. What was the other part of the result of the discipline that was handed down within the church? Growth. So we have unity and growth as a result of discipline. I want us to appreciate something. If there is sin within the church, if we do it God's way, what will happen? We will be more unified and we will be growing. That's an important thing for us to realize. Verse 15, So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, uh, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. So we see a little bit of the reputation that the apostles were, were beginning to have and the power that was seen among the, the, the apostles doing. Uh, the people believed that if I can just get, get someone that's sick, that needs their help, close enough to them that Peter's shadow touches him, that he, the shadow will heal him. Now, we have no evidence of that actually taking place but we certainly see the, the belief that the people had about that. Verse 16, The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. And so we see that the reputation of the apostles was beginning to reach uh, places outside of Jerusalem uh, as well. Verse 17, uh, but the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised at this. Satan has been at work uh, trying to hurt the church from the minute that it was established. Uh, and so far, he has been attacking them from, from the outside. Uh, he had been using the council, the Sanhedrin, to try to hurt the church. Warning the apostles, do not teach about this man again. Of course, the apostles didn't pay attention to that, as we'll see in just a moment. Uh, and then we, we just learned that Satan was trying to hurt the church. Now he had started to attacking it from within, from Ananias and Sapphira. But they followed God's plan and took care of that too. But we see Satan's not going to stop. And so we're back with the council, the Sanhedrin again, uh, mainly the party of the Sadducees. Now again, who are the Sadducees? They were the other main uh, sect of the Jews. They did not believe in the spiritual realm, right? Specifically, they did not believe in the resurrection, okay? And so what the apostles were teaching would have given them a lot of trouble and would have made them very angry, as we have seen and will continue to see. Uh, and so the high priest rose up and all who were with him, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. Now... I tend to think that this time they arrested all the apostles. Uh, some others think that they arrested just Peter and John again. I don't know. Um, but I tend to think they arrested all of the apostles. Now this time they put them in a public prison. This is a situation where they would have been around some pretty bad criminals. And so this could have been a scare tactic uh, from the Sanhedrin trying to scare the apostles. But it also would have been a way for them to discredit the apostles. This would have been seen by all. They were in public uh, view. And so they, in some respects, they were trying to discredit the apostles. But God's not going to let that happen, is He? Notice what happens, verse 19. 
But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now, we don't need to get confused with the angel of the Lord. This is not what this, is not what this text says. Uh, the angel of the Lord is someone that we see uh, some throughout the Old Testament, um, which by all evidence that is provided in the Old Testament was God, was deity. Uh, but here we have an angel of the Lord. This was a messenger that was sent by God to unlock the prison doors and release the apostles. Now, why did he release the apostles? Did he do it for their sake? to keep them protected. The primary reason that he released them from prison was what? So that they could continue to talk about Jesus. It wasn't really for their safety. In some respects it was. But the primary reason that he unlocked that prison door was so that the message of Jesus could continue to be, be discussed. And so he unlocks the door and what does he tell them? Get out, go back to the temple, and talk about this life. It's interesting that he describes the gospel message as life. That highlights to us that the only way that you and I can have spiritual, eternal life is through the gospel, is through Jesus. Now, starting here and a couple more times this morning, we're going to see, I think, the apostles, well, I can only speak for myself. They really put me to shame. Here they have been, they have been challenged over and over and over, and they've been teaching in the temple daily. At some point, Drew would say, you know what, I need to stay away from the temple. I don't like going to prison. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get arrested. I don't want people to be mad at me. All that kind of immature thought. But what do the apostles do? And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak, and began to teach. Did they question the angel? Not one bit. Did they complain to the angel? Not one bit. What did the apostles do? They obeyed. God says, go back to the temple and tell them about me. What did they do? They did it. I'm telling you, this, I, I don't, I'm not there yet. I don't know about you. I can't speak for you but I want you to think about yourself. You know these people want to hurt you. You know they don't like you. They know that you know that they, they don't want to hear anything you got to say. But what does God say? Go tell them about me. Go tell them about me. And so we see uh, an impressive amount of obedience on the part of the apostles. And this will not be the first time that we see that this morning. Uh, at the end of verse uh, 21, Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of Israel and sit, uh, sent to the prison to have them uh, brought. That is, the apostles. But when the officers came, <clears throat> they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, <clears throat> wondering what this would come to. This almost provides us with a, with a little bit of comedy relief. Um, here we have the council, the men who believe they have all authority, believe they're the ones that are in control, uh, that they're going to take care of this, quote, problem that they're having with the apostles. Uh, they've got them in prison, and now it's time, the, in the morning time, to begin their trial. And so... They send the people to retrieve them from the prison, and what happens? They're not there. And so really we're meant, I think, to see a comparison between these men who believe they have everything under control, and really the lack of control that they have, compared with God, who is sovereign over everything, who is able to control everything. Was it a problem that his men, that his representatives were in prison? From a human perspective, yes. But from God's perspective, it was not. 
And so really we see the, the comparison between the two uh, that can almost provide us with a little bit of laughter. Uh, and so they were perplexed and they were wondering what was happening. They didn't even know where they were. Verse 25, And someone came and told them, Look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Again, what were they doing? They were teaching. Verse 26, Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Now, I think we need to realize again something about the apostles. The apostles, it seems to me that the apostles went uh, peacefully, right? Uh, they didn't stir up anything. And it seems to me that they could have. The people loved the apostles. Why? They were able to heal them, right? They were able to take care of them and help them. And so the apostles really had the ability to stir up some trouble. But they didn't. They went peacefully. And I think they were following after the Lord's footsteps. Peter later in 1 Peter chapter 2 uh, is going to say when he, that was talking about Jesus, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges. Uh, and so they were following after their master's footsteps. They went peacefully. Uh, and, and I think that's a good lesson for us, for us to strive to live at peace with all as far as we can. Verse 27, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them. Remember last week we talked about what it would have been like a little bit uh, to be brought in before the council. You probably had the council in almost like a horseshoe shape, a U shape, and you would have been set in the middle of them, and they would have begun uh, questioning you. Now, we're not really sure exactly uh, which high priest is being talked about here. It's either Annas or Caiaphas. Um, I'm not exactly sure which one would be doing the questioning here, but one of those two. Uh, verse 28, he says, uh, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So, the charges are brought forward. Number one, we told you not to talk about this man. Notice they couldn't even bring themselves to name Jesus, could they? They just described him as this man. Um, and they said, we told you not to do it. What are they saying? We have the authority. Why are you not listening to us? Who gives you the right to disobey us? The apostles are going to answer that in just a moment. But then they, the second charge is that they filled Jerusalem with their teaching. How did the apostles affect all of Jerusalem? It's not a trick question. They just kept talking about Jesus, didn't they? How am I going to affect Byram or Jackson or Brandon, Crystal Springs, Clinton, wherever, wherever we're from? How are we going to change it? How are we going to affect it? Every opportunity that we have, we talk about Jesus. I'm telling you, I do not think we're going to go through this whole study of the book of Acts and see the apostles miss an opportunity to talk about Jesus. I don't think there's one case of that. I may be wrong, but I can't think of a time, at least right now, that they missed an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Over time, every single time, right? Death, burial, and resurrection. That's what's going to change this world. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so we need to be like the apostles, and we need to fill our surrounding area with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then the last uh, claim that was brought against them uh, by the high priest, uh, he says, and you intended to bring this man's blood upon us. I find that uh, somewhat funny. What was it that was said there in Matthew chapter 27? Uh, when Pilate was uh, trying to, really trying to release Jesus, um, what was the response of the Jews? May His blood be on us and our children. These men tended to forget that, didn't they? And so uh, we see that, uh, that they had already um, claimed that and taken care of that. Verse 29, But Peter... And the other apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. 
Again, if you want to, I mean, again, I'm just speaking for myself, but I cannot help but be impressed with the, with the apostles here. Um, here they are, they're being brought before the council again, and being challenged again not to talk about this man. And what is their response? You may not want us to talk about him, but guess what? My allegiance is to God. And God wants me to talk about him. So what am I going to do? I'm going to talk about him. I just, I, I can't help but be very impressed with these men. Uh, again, I'm not quite there yet. I want to be. What about you? Right. Yeah, that, res that responsibility, yeah. I think that's a good point, yeah. Mr. Chris brings up a good point. Really, all the apostles were weak at one time, weren't they? Um, and what was it that really changed them? Well, it was some of the difficult times that they went through, but also it was the fact that they saw the resurrected Lord. Uh, once they saw Him, and once they received the Holy Spirit, it was a different group of men, and they were not going to be shut down. They said, we must obey God rather than men. <clears throat> Verse 30, uh, <clears throat> The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging Him on a tree. God exalted Him at His right hand as leader. Some, some versions say as prince. Uh, that would just highlight the authority that Jesus has. He is where? He is at the right hand of the Father. He is on the throne. That's where the king sits. Uh, and so He is on the throne. Uh, as leader and savior, uh, verse chapter four reminded us that there is salvation in no other name except Jesus, uh, and so He is the leader or prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I find it interesting here that Peter describes repentance as a gift. It was given by God to Israel. God was giving Israel the chance to repent. Now, why am I stressing that? A lot of our friends will tell you that salvation is a free gift and there is nothing that we can do. Yes, salvation is a free gift. But is there something that we must do? Yes. There is not a single person that I know of that would tell you repentance does not take effort. How difficult is it to truly repent? To change your mind, to change your heart, to change the way you live. Is that easy? No, it's not. It takes great effort, but yet it's still a gift from God. And therefore we see that just because something is a free gift from God does not mean that we do not play a part and that we do not have responsibility in it. And so, uh, God was giving Israel the chance to repent and have forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who what Him? Obey Him. Again, uh, obedience is necessary on our part. Uh, verse 33, uh, When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. This is talking about the council when they heard the words of the apostles, that mini-sermon that they just gave. Uh, they were enraged. Does anybody's translation have cut to the heart? Cut to the quick. Anything else? Ma'am? Furious? Uh, it is similar. Uh, the, the, actual, the actual meaning is sawn asunder. Uh, and it, it, it sounds similar to Acts chapter 2, doesn't it? Uh, when the crowd heard Peter's sermon and they were cut to the heart. They were pierced to the heart. Um, what's the difference? The people's heart. The council were hardened, weren't they? They didn't want to admit that they were wrong. They didn't want to admit who Jesus was. They didn't want to hear anything about it. And so while this gospel reached their heart, guess what? <clears throat> it enraged them because they did not have a proper heart. And so this really takes us back to the parable of the soil, right? A lot of, it, takes, it takes a person to have the correct heart for the gospel to affect them, doesn't it? And so our job is just to get it to them, okay? Um, but we see that their heart was not 
not prepared for it. And so they were cut to the heart, but it, it led them to be enraged, to be furious. And so they wanted to kill the apostles. Verse 34, But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in, in uh, honor by, by all the people, uh, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. So who is Gamaliel? Outside of this information, we're not really provided much, at least within the biblical uh, text. Uh, there is some historical records that give us a little more information about him. Um, but as far as the biblical record is concerned, we know that he's a Pharisee and that he was a, uh, a scholar and he was respected. Um, but uh, one other thing that we, we also will learn later on is that he was the teacher of Saul of Tarsus. And so I wonder if, if, if Saul was sitting here. In, the, in this very instance. I wonder that. He may have well been here uh, at this time. And so Gamaliel stands up and he's really going to, uh, in some respects at least, talk some sense into the rest of the council. And so the first thing he does is he diffuses the situation by having the apostles removed from the chambers. Uh, and so they are taken outside and then he addresses the rest of the council starting in verse 35. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. Basically, sit down, calm down, and think about what you're about to do. Okay? Uh, for before these days, uh, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. And so he provides the council with two examples of basically uh, two men who had led rebellions um, and how, of course, their efforts failed. When they died, the efforts failed. Um, and so his first piece of advice is to leave them alone. Why? Because if what, they, if what the apostles are talking about are uh, from human origin, if they contrived it up in their own minds, what does he reason? He says it's going to fail. Now, I want us to pause for just a moment and think about something. I don't know if I completely agree with Gamaliel in this respect. Uh, a lot of us know people who are participating right now um, in a worship service or something that was contrived of human origin. And guess what? It's still lingering on. Now, ultimately, I understand God's going to take care of that in Judgment Day. Yes, I understand that. But as far as me and you are concerned, can we just leave false teaching alone? No, we can't. So in that respect, we can't follow Gamaliel's advice here. Okay? Uh, yes, God's going to ultimately take care of it in Judgment Day, but when we are confronted with false teaching, teaching from a human mind that it goes against what God has said, what are we responsible for doing? We have to confront it or the world's never going to change. And so we have to confront the false teaching. And then he goes on in verse 39, but if it is of God, you will not be able to throw them. You might even be found opposing God. Now this part he definitely got right. Is there anything that a man can do to stop God's will? You can hurt the messenger all you want, but are you going to affect the message? It's not going to happen, is it? And so he was right in that respect. So they, the being the council, they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Most likely this would have been a similar beating to what Jesus went through. Uh, they probably flogged the apostles. And we all remember what that is, right? A lot of times they would have a whip with... Uh, you know, prongs on the end and they would have metal jars of balls on the end and they would beat these men. Most of the time, 39 times. Just one short of 40. Um, and a lot of times, people would die from this beating. But we see that they beat the apostles and they let them go and they charge them not to teach in the name of Jesus anymore. Now notice again the response of the apostles. Then they, being the apostles, left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. 
What am I going to do if I suffer? I'm going to moan, I'm going to complain, and I'm definitely not going to do what I just did. That's how weak I can be. What about you? What did the apostles do? Not only were they just okay with it, what did they do? They rejoiced that they were worthy of being sufferers. What does that mean? They knew they were doing what God wanted them to do based off of being beaten. I avoid persecution. What about you? The apostles welcomed it because they knew that comes with the territory of following God. And then, after they were charged not to talk in the name of Jesus, notice verse 42, and every day, In the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Could you stop them? Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter what you say. You're not going to stop them. Every day, in the temple, in public, and house to house, they did not cease teaching Jesus as the Christ. What a challenge for me. Is it a challenge for you? Can you avoid talking about Jesus? Be honest. Can you? Are there days that go by that you don't tell somebody about Jesus? Probably. Not these men. And so the challenge is there for us. Next week we're going to go through chapter 6 and get into chapter 7 as well.